my name is Representative Jeffrey Elmore, and I represent the 94th District in the North Carolina House in the General Assembly. The 94th District consists of almost all of Wilkes County and Allegheny County, and it's a pleasure to serve you in the General Assembly. Today what I'm going to be sharing with you is some highlights from the short session that concluded on July 2nd of this year. Uh, this is the second year of the biennium. The way state budgets are determined and developed, they're actually two-year budgets. The long session is where the process of the development of the budget takes place, and in the short session we make adjustments to that budget. Also with legislation, uh, as legislation has to be introduced in the long session and make what is called crossover before it can be considered in the short session. Uh, this is to keep the length of the short session short and also focused on the budget. Uh, today I'll be sharing some budget highlights with you, also some legislative highlights of some bills that affect the area. When we came into the short session, which started the uh, last week of April, the state budget office uh, gave us our revenue projections for the short session. And I'm pleased to say that the state of North Carolina went into short session with a budget surplus. Uh, we had revenue surpluses for this year, and that is because of economic growth across the state. We came in with a $425 million surplus. And since that time, in the past couple of weeks, uh, as adjustments have been made, that surplus is even greater than what the projections were at the end of April. An additional $95 million in surplus is in the state coffers right now due to the economic growth. I'm pleased to say that uh, this last week, CNBC does an analysis of economic growth across the nation. North Carolina is now number five in business, climate, and growth in the nation. That is up from ninth from last year. So it appears that North Carolina has one of the fastest growing economies in the nation right now. Once the revenues are determined, then you have to look at what you want to place in reserves and also what you want the tax rates to be. Uh, the state legislator for the past uh, two to three sessions has, has a goal of building up our state reserve or what you might know as the rainy day fund. Basically it's the state savings account. Now what makes this important is this money ensures that state government can run in case if there is some sort of catastrophe, which our state has faced before, like Hurricane Fran several years ago that basically flooded all of eastern North Carolina. We placed 473 million in reserve funds this year bringing the savings reserve to an all-time high of nearly $1.6 billion. Our goal is to bring this savings account to what is called a fund balance of 8%. This is what we require municipalities and counties to maintain, and we feel like the state should hold that same standard for itself. We're not to that goal yet, but we are working towards it. Another exciting thing, we paid off this year $38 million dollars of loans that were taken out in the 1990s. Because those loans have been paid off, it brings a savings of $45 million a year to the state in interest payments. We also focused again on income tax rates this year. We have found that by lowering the income tax rate that it puts more money in people's pockets. Thus they spend more money and it helps grow the economy. So what we focused on this year for this tax year is first the standard deductions. Uh, for this tax year, 2016, you will see uh, the standard deduction increased $1,000. So for a um, filers that file married joint, uh, that's an increase from $15,500 to $16,500. And for folks filing as a single, it's an increase of $500. Now what this does is this is income that is not taxed. So this uh, increase in the standard deduction really helps our working families and especially the working poor because up to that amount is, uh, is not um, subject to the state income tax. We also focused on the income tax rate itself. We reduced it again. The personal income tax rate uh, was reduced from uh, 5.75 for this taxable year to 5.49 for the uh, next taxable year, which is 2017. 
So at the beginning of 2017 for that tax year, you will see that flat income tax rate uh, lowered again. So in a three-year period, we have went from a multiple tier rate to a flat rate, and we are lowering it again to inject more money into the economy and to help with our job growth. Once those are determined, then you can determine what the appropriations are going to be for the state for the upcoming year and what adjustments needed to be made to the biennium budget. The focus this year was compensation. Uh, we felt like that salaries across all aspects of state government had been flat and that we needed to not only do something for all employees, but look at certain areas of the government that needed focus and maybe adjustments on their actual scales themselves and pay grades. Governor McCrory signed this budget on July 14th in Union County um, this past week. Uh, I'm going to talk with you a little bit about the different departments in the budget, and then I'll share some bills that were passed that affect us all. First, public education K-12. These are our elementary schools and our high schools. Uh, what we did was focus on teachers in this budget area. We invested $190 million in our teachers, providing them an average of a 4.7% raise. This boosts the average North Carolina teacher wa wage to over $50,000. This is the highest it's ever been in state history. This is the largest teacher raise that was given in the nation for this fiscal year. Other states did not give this amount of raise to their teachers for the 16-17 uh, year. This is the first step in a goal that we have of making the average teacher pay in North Carolina the highest in the Southeast. Right now, we're not to our goal because our biggest competitor is the state of Georgia. This was not an across-the-board raise. The raises were adjusted uh, based on the pay scale to focus on recruitment and, te uh, recruitment and retention of teachers. We are still finding that it, we are having some problems getting some folks to come into the profession, so there was some focus on the beginning year teachers. Also, we're finding mid-career teachers. These are teachers that are from years 10 to 20. We're having some retention problems with those. So with the adjusted scales, we focused on those areas of the teacher pay scale. Uh, if you are a teacher and you are interested in looking at exactly what your raise would be and the percentage growth you uh, can see uh, based on your level of service, you can visit jeffreyelmore.com and under the news tab, uh, there are three charts that will be placed there that will show you a salary comparison for the past three years and will also show you your pay raise for your Pacific level uh, and the percentage growth that it is. Folks that work in the school system that are not teachers will be receiving a 1.5% salary increase and also a 0.5% one-time merit-based bonus. Uh, those bonuses will be distributed to the various counties uh, to be uh, determined by their evaluation process. Some other things that were interesting in the education budget. We made some adjustments to what are called teacher bonuses. The first one is we placed in a fund $10 million for what we're calling the new third grade reading teacher performance pilot. This is a program that is going to last for two years. The idea behind this is to help aid in our Read to Achieve program. This program's goal is to ensure that all children by the end of the third grade year are reading at grade level. So this fund will be used to give teachers bonuses if they see exponential growth with their students in reading at the third grade level. Also, there's bonuses that will be for career and technical ed teachers whose students pass industrial certifications. Uh, many of these classes are tied to a certification for the student, which gives them job skills necessary to help them enter the workforce directly after school. So if these students pass these industrial certifications, the teacher will see a bonus based on the number of students that pass uh, the certification process. We also are funding a $4.3 million uh, for teachers who teach advanced placement courses. These are courses for students whose goal is to go to a four-year university, and these AP courses give the student college credit if they pass the course. So what this bonus structure will be 
is the more students that pass the course under the teacher, the teacher will receive a bonus for each student that passes the course. So it really motivates the students and the teachers to ensure that the students will pass the exit exam and be able to give the college credit that they need and also will save them money on their college cost in the future. We also extended $5.8 million for special education scholarships. What these scholarships do is they help students that have specific special education needs, such as autism, be able to get scholarship money to spend on uh, what their specific needs are. May it be tutoring, may it be um, another type school that's uh, specified for their particular disorder or um, issue that they may have. Now affecting the K-12 system as a whole, we uh, increased the funding for instructional supplies by 2.5 million. This is the fund that pays for things such as pencils, papers, crayons, just the daily functional items that the schools need. We also increased the uh, textbook and digital resources item by 10 million. What those funds are used for is to purchase instructional materials and also to purchase digital materials such as software to help the kids um, be able to have books and the software that they need to be able to learn the best they possibly can. Another goal of the reading program, Read to Achieve, is we reduce the class size from grades K through three because we see that that level is really where reading and learning about uh, the basic skills of reading takes place. So we reduce the class size there to ensure that by the end of the third grade that all of our students will be reading at grade level. Also an issue in the long session that we ensured would not have problems this upcoming fiscal year is the driver's education program. Uh, it is fully funded and also we secured a funding source for it uh, to where this will not be a discussion in the future of lack of funds for that very important program that really affects the safety of us all. At the community college level, uh, community college employees will be receiving a 1.5% salary increase and also a 0.5% merit-based bonus. And again, those merit-based bonuses will be distributed for the supervisors to determine based on the evaluation. It also, the budget this year also provides $6 million worth of instructional equipment and technologies that will be distributed between all 58 of our community college campuses. There was a big focus on the university system in this short session. Uh, the first, we funded an additional $19 million to the university system that they can use at their discretion to help with salary increases, uh, extra enrollment growth they may experience, scholarship opportunities, and other programs. Again, the university level will be provided, all of the staff, a 1.5% salary increase and also a 0.5% merit-based bonus that would be based on their evaluation. Something I'm very excited about that happened at the university level was initiated by a bill that was filed in the long session by myself. Uh, it was HB 657. Uh, it is the idea and concept of fixed tuition. Uh, the bill went over to the Senate in long session as a study, but they were impressed by the policy and we have implemented that policy in the budget document. Now what is fixed tuition? This is a concept that as a student starts their freshman year in one of our 16 universities, whatever the tuition rate is that freshman year, they are guaranteed that same price of tuition for the following four years. What this does, it ensures for financial planning for the young folks as they enter the university level. Also, this will help ensure that they understand the amount of student debt that they're taking on. Because we have a nationwide problem right now of student debt and student loans as our young folks are coming out of the university system, really hindered by a massive amount of debt, which makes it difficult for them to buy that first car or to buy that house. Um, as they get these entry level jobs. So I'm very excited about the fixed tuition program that will be implemented at our 16 university campuses. Also another experiment that we're doing to deal with high tuition costs, beginning the fall semester of 2018, we are going to have three state universities that are going to have a set tuition rate. And that is going to be a tuition rate of $500 a semester for in-state students. 
These three universities are Elizabeth City State University, the University of North Carolina at Pembroke, and also Western Carolina University in the western part of the state. The selection of these universities was based on the geographic location of them in the state. Every state resident will be within 150 miles of one of these universities to be able to take advantage of this set tuition amount of $500 a semester. This could be a massive cost savings for our students as we need more trained young people in our workforce in North Carolina as the economy is growing so fast. Also to help with student cost, we want to ensure that the university, even though that the student is saving money on the tuition side, that they do not increase the fees dramatically. Uh, so we capped a 3% um, cap on student fees per academic year. So the universities can only raise the student fee by a 3% amount and cannot exceed that. Um, the ideas that we've put forth with the university system should be twofold. I believe that it is going to help keep the cost down for our students, which that's what our North Carolina Constitution says that we need to do with higher education, is make the cost as low as possible for our North Carolina citizens. But at the same time, it ensures that the bureaucracy at the university level is not growing exponentially as it has been for the past really 15 to 20 years. So hopefully these new initiatives will help balance both of those factors that are affecting um, our future workforce. Now for our retirees, what we have done, the retirees will be receiving a 1.6% one-time cost of living bonus. Uh, this is the idea of a COLA. The COLA will not be a permanent COLA, but it will be a one-time bonus where the retiree uh, state teacher participating in the retiree system will be receiving the check at uh, the middle of October of this year. Now some other areas of the budget uh, where we change some funding is health and human services. Uh, we see that we still do not have a proper handle on the mental health system here in the state and also uh, we are having some problems with substance abuse, especially opiate abuse. So what we have done, we have increased uh, the task force on mental health and substance abuse by $20 million. We also appropriated almost $20 million to increase the amount of behavioral health beds and also to construct a new child facility for children that are suffering from mental health problems. Although this step does not totally solve the problem, it is a step in the right direction to help with uh, these major concerns for our most vulnerable citizens. We also increased the support to help analyze and monitor our DSS uh, offices at the county level to make sure that they have the proper training to be able to implement what is called NC FAST. That is the computer program that uh, folks that is used to sign up folks for social services that they may be receiving. Uh, we felt like it was important to increase this to help with the efficiency of the DSS offices at the county level. We also increase funding for what is called the caregiver alternative to running on empty. This is to support families who have family members who are suffering from Alzheimer's disease. We also ex uh, expanded another 1.5 million to help the Alzheimer's patients and families by adding 320 slots to the community alternative program for disabled adults, also known as the CAP program. Uh, this should help uh, these caregivers as their uh, loved ones are in a very vulnerable state as they're trying to take care of them. We also increased almost $3.5 million to child care subsidies for children ages three through five. And we're focusing that money on counties that are tier one or tier two. That means that they're the poorest counties in the state. The goal of this child care subsidy is to help these uh, young mothers be able to uh, get back into the workforce. We also provide almost 15 million of funding to support our local health departments in their delivery of direct patient services, uh, things like immunization shots um, and other services that they are providing. Now in the agriculture and natural resources uh, area of the budget, we provided an additional $3 million to purchase 
uh, airplane equipment and heavy equipment for firefighting. We had found that the equipment that was being used in case if we have a massive for forest fire in some of our more rural areas of the state was extremely dated and some of it was even non-functional because it had not been replaced in so long. So hopefully those funds will help with that in case if we have any sort of wildfire situation in our state. Part of this budget was also an increase of $5.7 million for downtown grants. This was targeted towards 56 municipalities across the state that were in the middle of some sort of downtown revitalization project. The town of Wilkesboro will be receiving around $100,000 uh, from the state to help aid in their downtown revitalization project that they are getting ready to enter. We also increased by a half a million dollars the North Carolina Works Apprenticeship Program. Uh, again, this is to help folks get into the workforce and make that transition easier on them. We also increased the funding for the Clean Water Management Trust Fund by $8.6 million. Also, we increased almost $19 million for water infrastructure projects. Both of these funds are used to help with water projects across the state to ensure that all of our citizens have access to clean drinking water. Now under justice and public safety, uh, this is our courts and prison system, we've allocated $3.5 million to address the backlog of payments to lawyers who have represented indigent clients. Um, what this fund does is this helps ensure that folks who do not have the money to pay for an attorney can have legal representation. But a problem that we were having is we were having less lawyers participate in the program because they, uh, the payments for their work was becoming quite late. So by injecting this $3.5 million, hopefully this will help with that backlog of payment and encourage more attorneys to participate in the program. We also varied the scales and benefits for our state highway patrolmen, magistrates, clerks, correctional officers, the SBI, also the Alcohol Law Enforcement Division, and the Judicial Branch Division. The change in these scales had not been done in well over 10 to 15 years. So we actually analyzed the need in these particular areas and found that the pay scales that they were be paying, uh, being paid on was not keeping up with the competition from the private sector. So under those categories, they actually have a change in their pay scale and pay structure to increase it to be able to meet the demands and pressures from the private sector so we can ensure that we have the best people working for our SBI, our ALE, and in our court system, and also for our state troopers who protect our roads every day. We also insured money to get going what is called our Western Crime Lab. This will be the third crime lab that we will have in the state. We will have one in the western part of the state, also in Greensboro and Raleigh. The reason why this is so important, these crime labs process evidence that is used in cases uh, that are pending in the courts. And we had seen a dramatic backlog because of underfunding for 15 years of these labs. Uh, it is exciting to see that the Western Crime Lab will be put online in this upcoming year, and that will really help our area here in the 94th District, Wilkes and Allegheny County, be able to get our evidence processed quickly so our uh, courts can run more effectively. Now under general government, a highlight there that affects our area is $5 million for Workforce Housing Loan Program. What this program does is help folks be able to develop low-income housing, uh, which is becoming a problem in our area as our population is aging and many folks no longer have the ability to keep up with uh, their mortgage and they need to downsize. Uh, this will really help with that problem. Transportation, as we ride the roads every day and DOT funding, uh, we have increased uh, the state's infrastructure funding by $32 million for new highway projects. We also included $15 million for airport development across the state and almost $14 million for safety updates to our railroad system. We provided additional funding for both rural and urban transit systems. Uh, the 
transit systems that we have in the 94th is Allegheny in motion and also the WTA, the Wilkes Transportation Authority. So we increase funding for those areas to ensure that people are able to get to their doctor's appointments, the grocery store, et cetera, through our public transportation system. We also included some more money, $5 million, to support call center representatives to the Department of Motor Vehicles. This should help reduce wait times in our DMV offices. Now, how does the budget directly affect the district? Uh, we had almost some direct appropriations in the budget specifically to the 94th. Uh, the budget provides around $98,000 for the downtown improvement grants for Wilkesboro. We also uh, got $300,000 in addition uh, to the $11 million that was in the bond package for the new National Guard hub that is going to be built in North Wilkesboro. This will be a regional hub that will draw National Guard reservists for training from the entire Northwest region. We also got an extension for the 30-year 0% financing for the Wilkes water intake project with the W. Kerscott Dam. Uh, we extended the deadline. Uh, the deadline for them to have the funding secured was June 30th of this year. We had got that extended to October 30th of 2016. Those are the highlights of the budget, but there were several bills that moved through, policy changes that were started in the long session and we completed in the short session. Uh, these are some examples of some bills that went through the process that really affect the state as a whole. First, House Bill 148 was the insurance requirement for mopeds. After uh, several uh, very tragic accidents dealing with mopeds, uh, the state legislator determined that we needed to require them to carry insurance. Uh, that policy was signed, by, uh, is, was signed by the governor and is now in place to where a moped rider does have to have liability insurance on their vehicle that they're riding on the roads. Also, House Bill 598 uh, deals with boating safety. Uh, Representative Pittman out of Concord realized that if you were driving while impaired a boat, the laws were not the same as they were for driving a car. And there was a tragic death of a young lady on Lake Norman who was hit by a drunk boater and it killed her. So what this law does, it basically aligns the same laws for DWI on the road to the water. So it ensures that we do not have drunk boat drivers on our lakes in these recreational areas and being very dangerous with it. Uh, House Bill 1044 is a law enforcement bill that had several different factors, but an interesting part of it was what was called the Blue Alert System. What this system will do is if there is a policeman shot or injured in the line of duty and they are chasing a suspect, this will send an alert statewide with the information about that suspect so it will make it easier for law enforcement to catch that person. I think in the wake of everything that has been going on nationwide, this is going to be a valuable tool in the state of North Carolina uh, to help our law enforcement across the state from the municipal level all the way to the state level. Also House Bill 972, it's more commonly known as the body camera bill. This clarifies the use of police body camera footage and what the bill does, it ensures that the body camera footage is used as evidence in the case, that the uh, footage is not such a public record that it could automatically be pulled and placed on internet sites or sold in um, newspapers that sell mug shots and different things of that nature, that we truly treat the body camera footage as a piece of evidence and for use in the court to determine what actually happened in the situation that they're looking at with the case. Also, the governor has signed House Bill 436, and this really affects the attorneys in the area. This had been a long uh, dispute dealing with LegalZoom and the North Carolina State Bar, uh, and there was some confusion on if the documents that a person could produce on the internet was truly a legal document in the state of North Carolina. 
What this bill does, it clarifies the dispute between LegalZoom and the North Carolina Bar, so it ensures that when a person gets on the internet, that they clearly know the documents, such as a will or a land transfer or an LLC setup, the steps they need to take to be able to make it a true legal document so there's no questions about it later on. Now sitting on the governor's desk right now are around 30 bills and at the conclusion of the session the governor has until July 31st to sign these bills or veto them. If he does takes no action on the bills the bills will automatically become law. Here's some highlights of major ones that are still sitting on the governor's desk. HB 630 is called the Drinking Water Protection Coal Ash Cleanup Act. Uh, we placed into legislation a couple of years ago to deal with the coal ash uh, basins that are all over the state of North Carolina and what we do to clean them up. And as this process has progressed, one step that we felt was very important this year is this bill will ensure that folks that live within a mile radius of these coal ash basins will be guaranteed clean water via water lines or water filtration systems at no cost to them to ensure that they have clean drinking water in their household. Also, this bill deals with the risk classification for these basins. The risk with them varies greatly based on their location in the state. As a matter of fact, some of the coal ash pits have forest land growing on top of them. So what this does is deals with the reclassification of them so we can ensure that we are protecting the citizens that live around those the best way we possibly can. Another bill that's sitting on the governor's desk is House Bill 1080. This is called the Achievement School District. The concept behind this bill is a pilot program to deal with the five lowest performing schools in the state and how can we better serve those to where the students can see growth. This is an experiment pilot dealing with the role of charter schools uh, with those five lowest performing schools. Also, Senate Bill 667 is an elections bill that is sitting on the governor's desk. Part of that bill was a request from our local here in Wilkes uh, Board of Elections dealing with the number of days they have to canvass votes. We found inconsistency in the statute that uh, local boards of election only had seven days to do the canvassing for the primary election, but they had 10 days to do the canvassing for the general election. What this law would do is make that the same. Uh, you would, the local boards would have 10 days to be able to do their canvassing of votes. Not only was this a request of the Wilkes Local Board of Elections, about a third of the boards of elections across the state really wanted to see this changed uh, to be able to be able to get into the workload that they have uh, dealing with canvassing. Also part of that bill is a study of placing municipal election elections across the state in even number years. Right now, municipal elections are held in odd number years. Now, the idea behind this is looking at cost savings for holding elections in the state of North Carolina, making them all on even number years. This is a study that would take place to see the cost analysis of it and if there is truly any cost benefit to it. Now, as always, a very important part of my role as your state representative is constituent services. If you ever have a need, uh, communication with a state department that you're having difficulty with or you're not sure exactly who to call or contact with your problem, always feel free to contact my office via email, call, or even by letter. Uh, that is probably the most important part of my job is to ensure that you have proper communication with state government and that we can get you an answer my office doesn't always have the answers, but we do have access to uh, people who can get you the answer to help you with your particular need. Uh, I appreciate being able to share with you the highlights of the budget and legislation through the short session, and um, I look forward to continuing to serve you. Thank you.